All right, Atlanta Sports guys, we're back here taping this on a Friday morning right before uh, tomorrow. I head back to Atlanta for the weekend uh, briefly uh, back in the home state. But the Atlanta Sports guys, they are all here. Different time early on a Friday. But uh, Max Markovich, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Early on a Friday. Coffee ready. Let's go. How do you take your coffee, Max? Um, that's such a good question. Um, during the week, and I make it at home, straight mm-hmm. black coffee. Yeah. Uh, during the weekend, when I'm like going out and buying it, a little bit, a little bit of cream, a little bit of sugar, not a ton. Okay. See, we follow the same okay. ethos because I, if I'm making it at home, I it's black only. Like I'm, I just took a sip of black coffee. Like it's very important. Black coffee is very important by itself. But if I'm going out, I'm not going to buy something that I can just make at home. I will refuse. Completely I will agree. never buy black coffee out and about. Like it's always going to be a latte. It's going to be like I can't do a latte at my house. Like that is something where you have a talent that I don't have, and I'm going to make it worthwhile. But black coffee seems like the biggest waste of time to buy somewhere else because I could just do it in my house. Why would I do that? Max, I thought you were about to say that you're going to put whiskey in your coffee. <laughs> like I'll have a little Irish coffee. It's like oh, it's a weekend. Yeah, it's just fine. <laughs> I'm not above like, that. I thought but, you were going with that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, not not today, maybe tomorrow. Maybe some Baileys in your coffee. That'd be pretty good. Garrett, I used, Chad, to, drink also I used to drink those before Atlanta United matches whenever I would go like early in the morning. Ooh, perfect. Perfect okay. tailgating coffee. The best like drinking stuff, like weekend drinking stuff for me was always hotty toddies. Like love, I like hot tea a lot. And just the hotty toddies, like getting that in Asheville when you're in the mountains. I don't know. I, I feel like I've ever had a hotty toddy. I love hotty a hotty toddy. So good. I don't think I've ever Super had one. Good. It sounds, is it, so it's just hot tea and like, what is it? What's in it? Whiskey. Oh, that actually sounds nice. I, I'll, I'll drink whiskey just about anything. So. Like if you like hot tea, you'll like hotty toddies. Like it's just a whiskey version of it. It's, it's fantastic. It, it will, if you're a morning tailgate or like you're at, like pregame for an early Premier League match or something, and you got to get up and go to the bar and watch it. It's just the go-to. Do you pregame you, Premier League matches? Are you? Well, a, I mean, like, you a... <laughs> if you're those games are on four o'clock super, in the morning. <laughs> those games are on no super game. early. Like, you, I know, I know. Yeah. So if no, I'm go, a, I'm a Premier League guy. I just like you know, I'm not like waking up at like nine a.m. to watch the <laughs> Liverpool match and like drinking necessarily well, well what i'm saying is if you go to a match and like a lot of bars do that where you, the premier league watch parties so if you're gonna yeah. do that and you're like i don't really want to start hitting heavy 9 a.m uh it's a it's a light way to to get started um but yeah there you go hottie toddy free for premier league yeah liverpool yeah shout out to liverpool. i do big mohammed salah guy you max I'm also I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm I'm like a pretty big Premier League guy. We've never okay. we've never talked Premier League. I've actually but... dabbled in Premier League stuff in here before. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I respect it. I respect I don't have a club, but I mean I, I follow it. I need well, to it's get time for you to pick one. Yeah, you should you should uh you should get into the World <laughs> Cup and, and dive in. Oh no, Perfect I love time. I love world so- like, like world soccer. Awesome. I love it. English soccer, awesome. Love it. I just don't have a team. I don't know. It's, it's Le- not hard leads. for me to pick up a rooting. Leads is your team. <laughs> no, if it's not <laughs> leads. We're gonna go leads. Yeah, right, they have an American nice. manager and two American stars right now. Yeah, it sounds like they uh, they're finishing bottom of the table. Yikes! No, no, they're they're mid table. Really, they stayed up this year. They're yeah. mid table. I should I probably like cheer for. I've been told I should cheer for Tottenham because I'm an Atlanta sports fan. No, no, and no. just because it's just like a consistent let you down type of team. I, I thought you were Arsenal fans. like that's the majority of Atlanta fans. I wonder what the uh, majority of Atlanta fans are in the Premier oh, it's League. Gary's. My older brother's yeah. a Chelsea fan. Mm. My friends are Liverpool fans and Arsenal fans. It it, it spans. I have a couple Man City, Man U fans, mm. but not many. Yeah, my brother's a Man U guy. It feels dirty cheering for Man U. I don't think I can do it. I don't Man like City. it. I always resented the Man U stuff growing up. Like I just, I always resented the just the Beckham and the Ronaldo, and I just, it was never, never my. They're cup the of Yankees. Tea. They're the Yankees. It's a, it's fine. They're not really anymore. Manchester City is kind of the Yankees. Now. City is, destroys them yeah. now. But City like City is, the, City is the Yankees without any of the history. It's like yeah. literally like what is the, what is the appeal there? There's so many Atlanta fans listening to this of like I thought this said <laughs> Atlanta sports guys, not Premier League sports guys. That's my fault. I diverted us. No, we're we're good. We're good. Garrett Chapman, who you also heard, he's here. Good morning, Garrett. Um, we have like some... Uh, a little bit of cream. There you go. Oh, yeah. How do you take your coffee? <laughs> I drink it black, though. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> coffee talk. <laughs> coffee talk is important. Um, I agree. I love coffee. I'm going to get some more after this. Um, do you want to start with the Hawks, or do you want to start with the Falcons? Because I, 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 I parsed it 
between the two today because I have some different stuff I want to pick your brains on. Um, well, Hawks. Uh, Hawks, yeah. There you go. Okay. I want to start here where the Hawks, they, this is like right up Max's alley, I think. Dellen Wright, gone, right? Like it was just, he was a pleasant surprise for this group last year. It finally kind of figuring out the backup point guard spot for Trey. Um, he was really important late in the season as well. And in the playoffs and his defense, he's out the door. Now it's a holiday affair where Justin Holiday's in the building and now Aaron Holiday is in the building and it seems like he is going to be that uh, backup for Trey. Does that scare you? And it seems like an under the radar thing that Hawks fans should be prepared for that the backup point guard spot might be might be prob- uh, problematic all over again or because DeJounte Murray's in the building, it doesn't matter as much if that's a weakness going into next year. Yeah, I would say the latter. Um, I think that they probably would have re-signed DeLon Wright had they not traded for DeJounte Murray. Um, mm-hmm. But when you make that trade, one of the luxuries you can afford is not paying your backup point guard $8 million a year. Um, and so like their backup point guard effectively is going to be DeJounte Murray. And then Aaron Holiday can eat some of those other minutes. And I like Aaron Holiday. You know, like I'm not like a, it's not like I've been grinding Aaron Holiday uh, tape, but like I liked him in college. Um, and I think he's sort of a lighter version of what DeLon Wright brought you anyway. So like, it's sort of just like one of the luxuries you can afford with the DeJounte Murray move is that you would think, and we've, <laughs> we've already talked about this a few times that, um, that Nate will, uh, will, will be smart enough to stack Trey and, DeJ- um, and DeJounte is like, you know, a rich, rich, rich man's version of DeLon Wright kind of, um, so I think I think one of the things that was super important about DeLon Wright was being able to come in and run the offense. Like that was something in the first few years of Trey's uh, career that the Hawks just didn't have was like a functional second unit. Um, and, and I think DeLon Wright kind of brought that. DeJounte Murray, you're hoping that that's going to be a strength. You're hoping that second unit can be a full-fledged strength. And so, no, I'm not worried. I'm worried about other things. Um I'm worried about the wing depth in particular. Uh, I'm worried about uh, DeAndre Hunter in a number of ways. I don't know if we're going to talk about this, but um, Jake Fisher, I think, reported that the Hawks and DeAndre Hunter are not close on an extension number. Um, we'll see on that. But that is not a bunch of injury protections about. in that. <laughs> <laughs> you would hope. You yeah. would hope. I don't know. Maybe he's just like, yeah, no, I'm good. Like, let's just what what do you need injury protections for? I'm good. I'm healthy. This is it. 82 games. Let's go. What what's well, he saw worried? the Lou Dort number and he's like, I'm I'm Lou Dort times two. <laughs> oh. I, is this a take? I'd rather have Lou Dort over the next three years than DeAndre Hunter. Is that OK? Is, I, I think that's like a, there's an argument for it. I'm going to get games out of Lou Dort. I know I'm going to get great perimeter defense from Lou Dort. I Would you want to give Lou Dort five years, eighty-seven million, though? I think Lou Dort's going to be solid really for five years, wanna. eighty-seven million. I think he'll be fine. I know I'm going to get double the you, games. You know he's going to play. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that it's going to be a pain in the ass to go up against the Hawks with Capella and Yeka, uh, Dort and Dejounte Murray. I know that's going to be a pain. I that's I like that defensive rotation. I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Garrett? I mean, going back to what you guys were saying, like with the uh, as far as like the backup group is concerned, Dejounte Murray's. I mean, he's going to be your guy. I mean, like, you're tra- the whole reason you traded Kevin Herter is so that you can clear out minutes for Dejounte Murray to play. Mm. Um, Bogdan Bogdanovich, he, he can take the ball up the court if he needs to. This is purely a depth piece. Holiday is he's a guy who can do. He has comfort with uh, that's what he talked about in his his, uh, his presser when he got introduced to the team. Um, he has comfort. I mean, his brother's on the team. He know he's played with some of these guys before. He's he played under Nate McMillan in Indiana. And that's really the biggest thing for him. Um, and he's just a solid depth piece who's going to, like, he, he comes into the game, he'll play five to ten minutes a game. And whenever he plays, he'll, you know what you're going to get out of him. And that's about it. And I'm not, I'm not putting too much stock into what he can do, or, or I'm not going to compare him to DeLon Wright because you have DeJounte Murray. And DeJounte Murray is going to be that guy, which, like Max said, I pray to God that <laughs> Nate McBillard is going to stagger. Like, everybody in the NBA I think, thinks he's going to do, or hopes he's going to do. Uh, just so we can actually see what these two guys can do when they're taking the ball up the court on their own. But again, like you said, I, I pretty much agree with everything Max just said. Uh, wing depth is the number one thing that I'm looking at now. Uh, they got linked to the, they, they said that the the Kevin Durant series or whatever, 
we're not trading for Kevin Durant. He's not going to be here in Atlanta Hawks jersey. I have zero confidence that that's ever going to happen. Um, but because it, it's just going to rip out whatever we have as, in terms of depth. So um, I don't know what that next move is. I just hope it's going to, as far as free agency is concerned, just depth. I mean, that's all I can, that's all I can hope for at this point. Would you do, would you do uh, DeAndre Hunter, John Collins, Anyeka Kongwu, and two unprotected firsts for Durant? They wouldn't. After the DeJounte trade with what I we've would. already given up there? Right now, right now. It's no, I, would. I wouldn't do that. I would, absolutely. That I would, a, 100%. Yeah. Here's I mean, the you problem. With that. That. No, but they won't accept that. Did you well, see that? I, I, I know. I'm just saying, like, the Durant market really seems to have, like, gotten kind of weird in terms of, like, what teams are willing. Like, if, if the Pelicans aren't going to give Ingram, if the Raptors aren't going to give Scotty Barnes, like, what is the market? And so I'm not saying it is really any chance of happening, but I was thinking about it last night. And if the Nets were really trying to stay competitive and they could get – an all-star in John Collins, you know, an emerging potential all-star slash sub-all-star starter type of guy in DeAndre Hunter, and then Anyeka Kongwu, who is like a legit potential all-star, I think. Um, that, like, in terms of player uh, like compensation, that might be the best package of players they can get. Now, I think the picks being gone for the Dejounte Murray thing really holds it back. But you know, I was like thinking but you're about really it. Gonna tr- put your chips in. Right, Trey, Trey, Dejounte Murray, Kevin Durant, and Clint Capella, and then whoever else you put around them is like a championship caliber team. Here's the problem with that: you're building a team around Trey Young and Kevin Durant's personalities, and I, <laughs> um, I don't think that's lasting long. I don't think that's a. I just I don't think you can trust where Katie's head's going to be at, at year to year, and I think with how much things have shifted in terms of what contracts actually mean for these guys. Like I just, I would not, I understand you get a title. Great. It's also what the Nets thought. They thought they would get at least one. Like they were stunned. Like the fact that they did not get anything, anything, not even Eastern conference finals, NBA finals appearance with James Harden, with Kyrie Irving, with Kevin Durant. I just, I don't think I would go anywhere near that. I think I would keep building. I would definitely see what we at least have in DeJounte and Trey and see how they work together. And I just don't want to get in the Kevin Durant business right now. I think there are teams that are just like the teams that can get in the Kevin Durant business are like the Lakers, the Heat, the the teams where they're already a free agent destination where like they can figure it out. They can always get back and attract free agents even if they make a bad trade for a disgruntled superstar, they'll be able to bounce back. But if you're the Hawks and you bet wrong on that and you surrender all that depth and you surrender all that draft capital, you're looking at 10 years of just horrific uh, implications. And I don't know. I, I wouldn't go near it. I, I As cool as it would be to watch Kevin Durant as an Atlanta Hawk for a year, I'm not even the least bit convinced he would be here past a year. And if things didn't go right, right away, that'd be it. And if he didn't enjoy the lack of usage and, playing with Trey and whatever, like, I just, I don't think it's worth it. And I think that locker room, you want to, <laughs> I just don't think that would be, uh, I think the reports would come out. Uh, not having a good time, folks, is uh, what would come out. Uh, specific. I, I, I could be wrong, but that's just. No, wrong. it 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 will not happen. And we don't have mm-hmm. to spend more than like two minutes on this. But I was just like something I was thinking about of like, if you put those four together, like that is a, that is a championship level team. If it, you know, if everything worked out. And I do yeah. think the KD stuff, like, I think it the stuff in Brooklyn had more to do with who KD put himself around than KD himself. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying Trey is the right guy necessarily to put, to put around KD, but uh, yeah, I, that, that was kind of my only, I had that thought yesterday as like the market around KD is getting, I think pretty weird. Yeah. They asked for Carl Anthony towns, four picks and Anthony Edwards. Yeah. It's like, what does that even, are you, are you high? Like, I'm sorry. Like that's ridiculous. Like, I mean, it should start with one of the two. Like, if it you should want start this... with one of the two. Yeah, not, not both. Both, but I respect picks. it. Oh yeah, if you're gonna ask for it, I mean, ask for mm-hmm. it, whatever. And like, I'm hanging up the phone. Like, I'm sorry, Kevin Durant's a generational player. He's one of I the mean, greatest. He's still players a top two ever. player in this league. Like, when healthy, it's just if you want him right now in his prime, and this is not even just his prime. This is the last three years. Like, this is it. Like, this contract. Is yeah, I mean, he's Kevin also Durant. 34, and his health has has taken a bit of a dip uh, since the, since the injury. And you probably have two to four years. Yeah. Like you have to be able to capitalize on the two to four year window. So why is Minnesota trading Edwards and Towns 
to not be competitive with yeah. Kevin Durant for two to four, you know, like, and so like no one really meets that, that gap. I mean, there's like one or two teams maybe who could Toronto, uh, New Orleans, um, you know, whatever Phoenix, obviously, but yeah, I just don't like the Phoenix offer. Like, and I, I feel it seems like Brooklyn doesn't either. Well, I feel vindicated on the DeAndre Ayton stuff. Like that would have already happened. And like the fact that Detroit was still like the only rumored like Max team in on him. I feel vindicated about the folks who were like, Atlanta's got to get in on this. The DeAndre Hunter buying. And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think I don't understand why anybody would want to jump into the DeAndre Hunter, uh, DeAndre Ayton, uh, Max. <laughs> Freudian, Freudian slip there. I know. Right. <laughs> um, I just I don't I think there's a reason that he's still floating out there and the Max offer has not come and i i think that complicates stuff with the phoenix deal too is that like they're probably waiting to see what he does and what kind of offer he signs and then like that just but affects no, what but, t- but what's complicated offer. no but what's complicated is that he if he goes out and signs an offer sheet they can't sign and trade him they would have mm-hmm. to sign and trade him before he signs an offer sheet so they have to be like they have to play this game of is he gonna sign is he gonna go out and get a max offer sheet and then we have to decide on that should we preemptively sign and trade him should we wait until the market chills out i don't know Zach Lowe mentioned Indiana. In. Indiana makes oh why? What is what? I, I can't I I can't answer that. I'm just saying yeah. that I he said it on his podcast and that Indiana can't make the offer until the Brogdon trade is official on Saturday. That's so, so strange. We might get news on that this weekend. That would just be I just clearly Brooklyn doesn't want DeAndre Aiden. Like I think that would be already part of it. And I'm very surprised that Steve Nash and the co- Steve Nash coach team does not want DeAndre Ayton and to max out a big and make him a priority, like uh, just as a low post guy and just the style that he would need to play to make that contract worthwhile. It's not surprising that that's not where they're going and not an interest to them. Mikhail Bridges, great player, but you're still getting significantly worse uh, moving KD for Bridges and Ayton. I, I don't know. I don't like the Phoenix offer. To bring this back to, I don't know where we started on this, but um, coffee. Coffee, of course. <laughs> uh, do we like, what do we think's going on with John Collins right now? There's, it's been like very quiet, and there's been a lot of like, I think I think Mark Stein maybe said he still expects Collins to get moved, um, but there's been no traction there, and it doesn't really seem like there's any offer out there that actually makes the Hawks better. And the consensus fan agreement is like the Hawks are probably just better keeping him. Um, but we also haven't heard like did John Collins ask out? Does management? Is, is management doing this on their own? Like, what's the deal? And I just like don't know what the read is there because I feel like the roster as constituted right now is a is a really good roster finalized. Um, but it just doesn't seem like they're done, and I don't know what the move is. What do you think, Eric? I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I I don't think how how does Atlanta get better by trading John Collins right now? I don't think they do. Um, John Collins is the best chance for this team to be competitive right away. Um, you're not going to go out and find a guy. I mean, like, look, you, this has been a, like a surprisingly slow market for John Collins. I mean, for someone for for, for how much heat it and, and traction it, it had just two, three weeks ago, it, it has just been completely stalled. And I, I, at the end of the day, like maybe you can trade him and recoup some of those picks that you lost um, from the Dejounte Murray trade. I don't really see that happening necessarily. I mean, where does he go? <laughs> uh, I, I'd like to say. I mean, I'd like to see him in Atlanta Hawks jersey. I think the team is best off, best keeping him. Uh, I mean, you're not going to find a guy who's going to get 18 and 18 and eight, even if that's what he gives you is like your third or fourth option. Um, that's pretty good. That's pretty darn good. And if he continues to improve his his efficiency numbers from the outside and shooting that three pointer, even better. Um, because I, I don't know if if Jalen Johnson is necessarily ready for for that larger role. If you if if Jalen Johnson comes in and impresses and in, in, in limited minutes early in the season, John Collins is probably on the move by the, by the, uh, the trade deadline, but I just don't see a move happening at this point based off of what I've heard and seen so far. I don't know. I feel like it's a would be the difference here where if a three point shot is there and he's able to space the floor more kind of like what Collins does at the floor where Collins is not a shooter. It's not like the spacing's all that great with Collins and Capella, mm-hmm. but Collins has gotten better each and every year 
shooting. Like he's a good catch and shoot three point shooter in the corners, and that's his bread and butter. And if Anyeka is serious about that, and Anyeka is that kind of player this year, or he has that range now, and he is someone who can hit thirty seven percent of open threes in the corner, or something where defenses have to come out and account for him on the perimeter, and you can play him and Capella together, that makes a John Collins trade more feasible. I'll I'll believe it when I see it with Jalen Johnson and any young players really in this Hawks rotation under Nate. But to your point, uh, Garrett, I do like what we've talked about. And what I've said from from just months ago was just that like the Hawks, the problem with the John Collins trade for Atlanta was always that they're going to get worse. And the plan right now is for the Hawks to get better. And there is no trade out there for Travis Schlink that uh will make the hawks better in 2022 2023 by moving on from john collins that person like harrison barnes is not on the way so if it's not harrison barnes and there's nobody like that out there that you're going to be able to flip john collins for you might as well keep him but that's just you're risking a really weird locker room dynamic with him coming back and just what that relationship's like with him and trey and that's he wants a bigger role and if Dejounte's in the building and he's going to have a bigger role that like John Collins will get less shots next year in Atlanta. John Collins will be featured even less in Atlanta. And that is a dangerous roll of the dice on a team that wants to get back in the top four in the East and be an Eastern conference title contender. That's a, I, 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 I don't envy the situation Travis Schlink is in because I think he's kind of damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. And on the other side of it, they did it to themselves, like putting John Collins in trade rumors and him just getting at it like that stuff leaking for two years, essentially to a guy that has done nothing but gotten better every year and been really loyal to you and just been a fan favorite for years. I mean, Collins is right to be upset and one out and to feel kind of undervalued by this organization in a lot of ways. I don't know. But what I, do you, what do you think? Max? I, I think part of the on court assessment is like, if his role is going to decrease and his role is going to strictly be like catch and shoot threes, you know, roll dunks, like that's kind of it. Then like someone can fill that role on a cheaper contract and you can recoup some of the future assets. Right. Like it, it's right to say that Trey and DeJounte are going to like own the usage. And if you are extending DeAndre Hunter, at least part of the calculation is like, he's also going to take sort of a step forward in usage like that does even further minimize John Collins who had been even who's been basically minimized for the last three years, like increasingly. So, um, and I think that the point of like the trade, like you're not getting better by trading John Collins, but you also might not get worse if you're filling mm -hmm. someone who can, who can fill that shooting role, who can defend and like do 90 to 95% of the things John Collins does in this offense anyway. Um, not be 90 to 95% of the player John Collins is, but to like do the things that he does in this offense. Um, but I just don't even know that that trade is there anymore. And it's also like at some point, why are you so hell bent on trading a 24 year old all star level player for pennies? I mean, like, you know, like what, what does that really end up accomplishing? And I think, I think it is sort of a self, it, it could be a self inflicted wound. Um, to have basically put it out there that all you want to do is trade this guy, be so hell bent on trading him, and then when the offer's not there, you know, then what? Like, I hope they have a come to Jesus moment this summer. That's what I'm hoping is they all get together and they just hash it out and just say, "Hey, we're not putting you on the block. We're taking your name off. We're not taking any calls. You're part of our piece. Like we we'll, we've seen what you can do for this organization. We've seen us get to the Eastern Conference Finals with you just." Uh, put just being an important cog in that rotation and what we do like hey I, I just that's what I'm hoping I'm hoping they don't move him just for the sake of moving him and just run it back I understand the like I said the volatility of bringing him back based on everything that's happened and his role like you pointed out Max is just the usage is going down like the shots will be going down it's like are you okay with that and if he's not then you have another problem but I don't know I think that should be priority one what do you think garrett i mean the best case scenario was to go and find somebody like pj tucker to fill that role trade yeah. john collins bring in pj tucker a guy who's going to come in and and be that that hard-nosed son of a bitch defender um who doesn't really care all that much about his offensive production necessarily and it's like hey the ball's not in my hands all the time but i'm 
making a contribution on the defensive end, I'm, I'm going to be tough. Um, and I'll, I'll do catch and shoot threes. And that's good enough for a guy like that. I think if that's the route that the Hawks, not necessarily PJ Tucker, but a PJ Tucker like player, <clears throat> if you get a guy like that, and I think this, it's almost addition by subtraction with, like Max said, with the, uh, uh, with, by moving on from John Collins, if that's the player that you go and get, I just don't know who's available anymore to go do that. So I think the Hawks have really played themselves into a corner with John Collins. I mean, like, this has been, like you said, two years coming, and I don't know how you necessarily recover from all of this. And I, I don't know if John Collins is, is that player based off of the dynamic that you've built on this team. Well, we're going to get an answer soon. I think they kind of have to come out and say we're not trading him or he's getting moved soon. I think you have to you can't let this drag out into August and September. I think you you need to make a decision very soon what you're doing with John Collins Mm -hmm. um, and start working uh, to figure this out. If you had to guess with this rotation, if it's right where it is right now, Garrett and Collins, he's there. Let's say they run it back with this group. Now we have a pretty good idea. I think the eight or nine guys that Nate's going to run. Um, I think there could be some surprises, obviously, but I think the eight or nine are pretty solidified here. Um, where do you think they fall in the East? Is this a top four team as they, st- if they bring back Collins, DeAndre gets extended, he's healthy and the rotation is what it is. Like and everybody think- stays healthy. Yeah. And most of the big, most important thing is that everybody stays healthy. Right. So, yeah. um, I think this is a team that falls within, I think this team could win 50 games. I, I, I think that's really where they are. Um, I don't see them necessarily. They're not better than the Celtics. They're not better than the Bucks. Um, I think that'd be a very difficult series for them to win. I think they could theoretically win it if, if they get hot, I, like they did two years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, this, I think they're, they're they're right there, fifty games. Um, is, is that bet good enough for top four in the East? Maybe, maybe not. But if they're they're in that four or five range in the Eastern Conference, I think that's good. I think that the next move is critical. And that is what's going to get them up to the high 50s, low 60s range and Mm. championship contender level. Um, But as it stands right now, I think this team can win 45, 50 games. What do you think, Max? I think it just all comes down to the Trey DeJounte fit. And we just Mm. won't know that until we see it. Like, talent wise, I I do think they're like, you know, it sort of depends on Brooklyn, I guess, and how that all shakes out. But, um, you know, I do think Boston and Milwaukee are clear tier better. I think Philly, depending on how things shake out, could be a sort of half tier better. And then Mm -hmm. I think the Hawks are in that next that next group. But I think like there's a lot of volatility there. Like the Hawks could be better than that. I could also see them being worse than that. Um, And that is sort of contingent on like how Trey and DeJounte fit together and how that all that all works out. I also think it's a little bit contingent on the coaching. Uh, which, which we're not, I don't think any of us are super optimistic about. Um, but like, it's a super talented team. I think it's like, it's just as talented, if not more talented than the team that made the Easter conference finals. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it all comes down to that fit for me and we won't know it until we see it. Well, plus, plus, I mean, if you, you're assuming that in this, in this scenario that bogey and, and Deandre Hunter stay healthy, Clint Capella, he stays healthy. If these guys are healthy, then all of a sudden, I mean, this team is a much better team with, with a healthy Bogdan McDonavich. And then when DeAndre Hunter is playing well, look, you have your wing guy. So th- this team goes through far too many spurts of, of just being woefully, woefully injured. Um, and if they don't do that next year, I mean, what's stopping them except for themselves, like you said? Uh, Eddie Goldman signed by the Falcons uh, defensive lineman. It shout out to Aaron Freeman of locked on Falcons who was on this months ago of like, uh, that's probably the one that they signed. And I'm like, okay, file that one away. And then lo and behold, Hawks are the Hawks, the Falcons add Goldman. What, uh, what, if anything excites you about Goldman to this defensive line rotation? Because Hey, he fills a need. Like when you look at who might be starting at defensive tackle uh, out of the gate here in Atlanta, you're, the body will not hurt right max <laughs> yes that is that is correct i'm not sure anything super excites me about it uh i'm not like you know oh man now it's a six win team um but i think you know they have to they have to have nfl level guys and that's an nfl level rotation guy who can occupy some space and like Grady jared do's work um and i think like it's it's hard for me to talk about the falcons this year because it's like there's there's almost not an in- there's an intent to win, 
by the coaching staff and the players and there's an intent to win, but the way the roster is constructed constructed and with all the dead money, like it's not a year where you're like, Oh, is this the piece that, that puts them into contention? Right. Um, and that's why I think like all of the, all the off season talks a little bit misguided. Like you're not looking for veterans who are, you know, who are going to, you know, put you over the edge there. You're not, you're looking to give young guys opportunities. You're looking to field an NFL level roster you're looking to, you know, quote unquote, build winning habits and whatever, but you're not really looking to win. Um, so I, I don't have much of a reaction beyond that other than like, yeah, I hope it makes Grady Jarrett a little bit happier. What do you think, Garrett? I, I think Grady Jarrett's got to be thrilled with this. Um, I, I think Goldman comes in and fills an immediate need. Depth on the defensive line was a critical issue, uh, especially at, at nose someone who's going to actually come in and play a proper nose tackle on this team. This guy, he comes in and fills that need perfectly. Um, and then you're able to stick Grady Jarrett next to him. And I think that's fantastic. Um, but it's like, like Max said, it's like, this isn't a team that's trying to win a lot of games this year, but don't tell that to the players or to Arthur Smith, because <clears throat> no, look, these, those guys, as far as they're concerned, they're trying to win every football game they go and play, which I love. I love that mentality. Um, you need that in a football team, obviously. I mean, and this team needed depth. Um, it's going to highlight the attributes of Grady Jarrett and, and hopefully take off some of those double teams from him. And I think he could really turn in a Pro Bowl season, which is a win. I mean, you just signed Grady Jarrett to a big old fat contract, so you might as well get some production out of him, you know? And I think this is going to be one of those moves that's going to help illustrate that and help him shine a little bit. Um, I mean, and Goldman's 28, he's a veteran presence. Uh, he's a guy who's, who's not going to come in and flash necessarily with stats or tackles or whatever, but he's going to absorb double teams. And, and that's exactly what this defense needed. Um, I think it's going to help the linebackers. I, I think if you have a strong nose in this type of defense that Dean Pease runs, you have a strong nose. It helps the rest of the defense flourish because he absorbs blockers. And so like you get guys like Troy Anderson, who's going to run free. Um, I mean, that's exactly what like Deion Jones needed in the past. He needed guys who were able to absorb the offensive linemen because if those guys get to that second level, Deion Jones is rendered almost worthless. And we saw that last year. Um, so ultimately I think it's, it's not necessarily, we're not going to look back and be like, Oh, this was the pit. This was the play that like, this is the guy that we signed and that changed everything. No, I don't think so, but he's, he's a good piece and he's a veteran presence that this team needed. I like it when Ryan Pace just like sent a text to uh, uh, to the to our current GM uh, Fawn Knot and just being like, uh, "Hey, is it my turn? All right, yeah. What what do you got, Ryan? What do you got? Okay, if there was this guy in Chicago that I liked time. a lot, huh? If we had a dollar every time they signed a bear, yeah. It, well, we got Phil Emery in the building and we got Ryan Pace. Like, there's uh, several different uh, ex Chicago GMs in the. Like, As we know, that's building. that's the franchise you want to model yourself mm -hmm. after, Perfect. Chicago Bears. I mean, I like it. Um, we'll end on this. So the Falcons, they all they've signed Goldman, so that'll be fine. The summer safety battle. Um, is it gonna be two young guys starting in the back two? Is it gonna be a cover two situation with those two guys and they're gonna lean on the youth where last year it was the two veterans and it did not go particularly well, but it's also like, okay, do you hand the keys over to Hawkins and Grant? Like, is that ultimately what you do? What do you think, Max? Who do you think is ultimately going to win the summer battle? And who would you want to see win it? I think it's a good sign if it is the two young guys, but it's not going to be like a, it's going to be a meritocracy. I think that's kind of what we've learned. They're not just going to be like, as much as I think all the fans, we would like to see the young guys get reps. And I think this is a lesson we will learn with the quarterback battle too. As much as we would like to see the young guys get the reps and go through the ups and downs and see what they're made of, Arthur Smith, like they're not just going to roll them out because they're young and they're draft picks, right? They're, they're going to play the best players. Um, and you would hope, like I think, as we've said, like the tie goes to the younger guy, right? Like if it's if it's neck and neck, that they they take the chance on the younger guy, but it's not going to work that way. Um, and I think that's kind of also how we've we need to approach the quarterback battle. We talked about when is when is Ritter going to start. Um, like over under, I don't. I I would be very surprised if like week one, they were like, eh, let's just let's see it. I don't think that's going to be it. Um, and I know Chase, you might disagree on that one, but I think it's it's they're trying to like Arthur Smith is like gets pretty pissed everyone every time anyone says 
oh, you're not trying to win or, you know, it's a rebuilding year or anything like that. No, he's going to, they're going to play the best football players. Um, and I do think there's optimism that um, Hawkins in particular is, is going to, I think, be a starter. Um, and I think that they like him a lot. Richie Grant, like we just got to see it. And like, they're not just going to say you were, you, you, we invested in a lot in you, your second round pick, figure it out. Um, so if he's not one of the best guys, he's not going to play right away. And they're all going to get a lot of reps. So we're, we're going to know by the end of the year, like can Richie Grant play um, one way or the other? We're going to know. Um, so if I had to bet by, by the end of the year, I would say the two, the two of them have the most snaps. Um, but I don't know if it's going to start off that way. What do you think, Garrett? I don't think they would have re-signed Eric Harris if they were completely convinced that these guys mm. were ready to play. Um, Eric Harris, he was on an, he was on a one year deal. He would not have come back if if they were completely convinced that these guys were ready to go. So, are they ready to go? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I talked I, I talked very very highly. I spoke very highly of Richie Grant last year. Mm. Um, I mean, I thought he was going to be uh, come in and be an immediate impact player and be a defensive rookie of the year candidate. That's really what I saw from him. I still think he can take the uh, one of the biggest leaps of anybody in this draft class. He and Jalen Mayfield on offense. Um, look, I, he's a ball hawk. He's a guy who's a perfect free safety. He's a guy who's going to come in and hopefully take that job. And Jalen Hawkins is a he's a tough dude, and he's and he he can also like, play coverage very effectively. Um, but they're young and they're inexperienced. And Richie Grant played out of position almost the entirety of last year. He played in the nickel most of the time, just out of necessity. Um, so I think Eric Harris is going to be the veteran presence. He's going to get snaps. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see Eric Harris start at either one of those positions, because, um, that's one thing about most of these guys is that they can play both positions pretty effectively. Um, I, I think Eric Harris will be the starter at first, and then it's going to drift over whoever plays better. So it could be Jalen Hawkins and Eric Harris, or it could be Richie Grant and Jalen Hawk uh, and uh, Richie Grant and uh, Eric Harris. The, the young guys, I think, are going to have these jobs by the end of the season. I, I just It's year two of the Dean Pease experiment on defense, and uh, he's it's supposedly is un unveiling the rest of the playbook or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that these guys, as the season progresses, this, they're going to build it around these two safeties. And uh, I, I, th I really like these two guys. I think that they could be a bright spot for this defense in, in 2022. But um, I just got to see him play, like Max said. We just got to see it actually like, manifest itself on the field um, because most of the time it's been mostly talk uh, up until like this fall. So I want to see what they can do. But uh, outside of Grady, I mean, I, we're a year away from this being an extremely young defense. Like, I don't know if y'all have looked at it, but the turnover now, we're looking at take one Graham, fifth rounder last year. You've got Grady, who's obviously older, but you just drafted Malone. He might be on the outside next year. Um, he's a third rounder. You get Troy Anderson, Mikhail Walker, who's still a fourth rounder in 2020. In 2020. Um, you go to Ebiketti, who obviously this year, AJ Terrell, 2020. Jalen Hawkins, 2020, Richie Grant, 2021. I mean, you go up and down the list. Like these are all guys that you've drafted in the last two to three years. Like they're banking a full on. We are scouting and developing our entire defense through our draft. But I, I also think you're a year away from like uh, what I hope to get from this year is to identify which of those young guys can play, which of those young guys can't play, and then filling in the holes through free agency. I mean, you're 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 a year away from an ungodly amount of cap space. Yeah. And so allocating that cap space responsibly, I don't think they're just going to throw money, but I, I do think they're going to like supplement a lot of these young guys with veterans. Um, and you would hope safety is not one of those spots because of what they've invested at safety. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it, you kind of just have to see who can play and who can't play. Like, I think they're, they're optimistic at linebacker. Um, I think you will probably end up supplementing some of this edge rush. Um, even if Ebiketti a stud, like you, you have to, um, and I think, you know, they're optimistic at corner, but, you know, Casey Hayward's not getting younger. Um, so I think I think that's part of the equation, too, is like throw out these young guys, see who can play and cut bait when you know that, it, like, you know, you're not just going to be beholden to like a second round label. Right. You're not just going to say, oh, we invested so much. We have to. This has to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think I think that's part of it is like the offense I think there's I have some optimism that the offense is going to 
develop and you have the weapons to like be a, a good offense eventually with what you have. Uh, I think the defense is where you're really going to want to supplement with with veteran free agents, especially because that youth. But it's for those reasons that I think that this team might be a little better than people expect them to be. Um, some people peg them as like three, four wins. Garrett's already I, there. Wow. No, it's going to be. No, the thing is, I'm like, not this there. Is, like they're 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 going to be competing. I, I just want to see them be competitive in football games. Um, they're they're going to lose a lot. Like they're going to lose a lot of football games. I'm not. Don't 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 get it twisted. Um, but I think that this team is is better than people give them credit for, just because the pieces are there. They're the kind of raw tools. Like you just gotta, but they just gotta continue to develop. I also think like there's a huge difference between like are you the Jaguars or are you the Lions? Like yeah. the Lions were a competent NFL franchise that was like well coached and put together and didn't have the talent to like be like a playoff team or anything really close to it. But they were like competent. The Jaguars were incompetent, and I think that you would hope that you're not incompetent right you would hope that you have the infrastructure to be like a competent well coached just like deficient on talent team and i think that's like that's the goal right is it's not like a win total it's like are you competitive do you like show signs of like being a a normal nfl franchise could agree more i mean that's why arthur smith and like i would like i understand having talked to just so many coaches that they just don't that's such a crappy thing to ask them about is coaches don't see that day to day. They their Smith's goal is like, do they get our scheme now? Is like, are how comfortable are they with our guy? Like, are they like they're just they don't think in terms of wins and losses. That's just not how it works, and they're not tanking that way. And they're looking at like, oh, this position group got this much better this week. This clicked with them today that hadn't clicked with them all year long. Like, that's just not at all and based in reality for how coaches see it. But like, ultimately, it's a reflection on Smith more than anyone. Um, mm. I think that that's sort of like the best it's, it's, it's hard to gauge, um, quantitatively cause like wins and losses don't always tell that full story, but like right. this level of competence, like, are you the lions or are you the Jaguars is a reflection on Smith versus, or, uh, uh, Campbell, Dan Campbell versus urban Meyer. Right. Yeah. Well, we got to run, uh, Garrett's a busy guy. He's on the radio now. He's got his own show on the weekends. Yeah. Like uh, how was that? You're now an on air guy. It was incredible. It, it was so much fun. And if it wasn't for the fact that I was um, taking the girlfriend to the lake this weekend and already booked everything <laughs> like months, like a month in advance, uh, I'd be doing it again this weekend. But I'll be I'll be back on air next weekend. Uh, we're calling it the Dopey Millennials. There are two of us, mm. both millennials. So right, and they yeah. call us the Dopey Millennials at the station. Just all the young guys there. So we we decided to make it our own. You know, um, own it. Hey, millennials aren't y- young anymore, by the way. When is it going to register for people like millennials? Yeah, there's like 40 year old millennials. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. We're not, we're not yeah. old. I mean, young anymore. Like, that's just yeah. not reality. So, when Max, people and talk I, about, Max and I are basically like the, the bottom of the barrel. I'm Gen Z, technically. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Gen Z is what people mean when they say millennials. I mean, 100%. Yeah, now, now it's like the 21 year olds are like, oh, you millennials. It's like, no, it's not a millennial. What are you talking about? And but, yeah, I, I hate I'm that old where I'm like, hey, refer to us as who we are, which is old. That's who we are now. Like we're, <laughs> yeah, we're not there, there. we're not young. What do you mean? We're, we're, we're influencing to culture, be houses, and and having children and whatever. Buying houses in this economy? Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> no, nah, not for a few years. <laughs> On a radio salary? What are you talking about? No, nah, but mean, I'm, I'm heading over. We got to do uh, high school football. Is already getting going. So we're yeah. We got the scoreboard show. It's uh, coming in for year two, and I'll be back in the field reporting on these high school football teams. It'll be fun. You and me both. East Tennessee is a little bit different, though, than covering uh, uh, Atlanta and the greater Georgia high yeah. school program. I will tell you, it's a little bit different. Town <laughs> pool. Different, different town <laughs> pool. Um, yeah. Max Markovich, Garrett Chapman, thank you as always. I greatly appreciate it, and I will talk to you all next week.